Julius uh, Walton Green from Washington University in San Luis, and uh, he will speak about uh, talk about domin dominating sets in Bergman spaces and strongly pseudo convex domain in CM. So please, Walter. Okay, thank you. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm uh, thankful to uh, Mark Antone and the other uh, organizers for uh, inviting me and getting together this great program. So uh, yes, I'll be talking about the dominating sets in uh, Bergman space. So uh, we'll just be go ahead and begin by talking about uh, what is a dominating set. So in, uh, in the abstract, if we look at some function space, which we'll use the script F for, uh, which lives on a domain omega, and this om domain omega has a metric and a measure uh, associated to it, then uh, a dominating set are the sets E, the subsets of the domain for which uh, you can basically continuously reconstruct uh, the functions in the space by their values on that set E. So uh, here is this, the values of F on the set E, and here's the values of F on all of omega. So E is a subset of omega. So of course there must be some sort of structure on script F for some inequality like this to happen. And there's a, of course many different options for what script F can be. Uh, so these questions have been considered by many authors and they have complete solutions in the more classical function spaces, like the Hardy space, um, certain Paley-Wiener spaces, certain Bergman spaces, they have uh, partial uh, solutions in. Well, for the dominating sets, they have complete solutions in many Paley-Wiener spaces in the Bergman spaces as well. Uh, but a, a more general problem that one can also look at is instead of just looking at uh, sets E, can also define a reverse Carlison measure, which is a measure nu, uh, which again sort of samples or carries all of the information with F with respect to the intrinsic measure mu. So the uh, Dominating sets are a special class of the um, reverse Carlson measures. They are the ones that are like, um, which are like d nu equals indicator e d mu. So the, the uh, dominating sets are a special class of this. And uh, we're going to discuss the dominating sets in the Bergman space. And also we're going to be able to get some partial results toward the reverse Carlson measure problem. But in general, the reverse Carlson measure problem is a lot harder and it has a complete solution in very, very few spaces. I know of the solution in the Hardy space on the disk and that's about, that's about it. Um, so, okay, let's get uh, moving, talking about the uh, Bergman space. So the Bergman spaces are, uh, we take the domain in the complex uh, in dimensional space and the domain omega has a smooth defining function. What that means is that omega is equal to the set where the defining function is, let's say negative. Then we can define these weighted Bergman spaces as follows for any P and any alpha uh, larger than negative one. So they're just the uh, functions in LP of omega with respect to the weight rho to the alpha, uh, which are holomorphic. So that's what this F in whole omega means, the holomorphic functions on omega, which are integrable with respect to this, uh, this LP norm. So the first thing to discuss is that if the domain omega has a nice group structure, then the dominating set problem becomes slightly simpler. And the first simplification is that there's an immediate necessary condition, which is that E must be relatively dense, which means, so uh, relative density means we take our set E and we test it over some collection of balls. Uh, and I haven't said specifically what the ball BZR is, but 
for now we should think of it as a ball that is invariant under the uh, automorphisms of omega. So it's pretty simple to check that such a condition is necessary uh, to be a dominating set. And uh, it's been shown to be sufficient in many cases. So this problem was originally studied now 40 years ago uh, by Luking uh, for the disk. And uh, he also generalized his methods to many uh, different domains, which are it's called homogeneous. It's the homogeneous domains are the ones who have a full automorphism group, which means they have automorph they have biholomorphic automorphisms which map every point to every other point, right? Like like the Mobius transforms on the disk, they have a, an analog of that. So when you have this group structure, uh, the problem is more or less solved by looking a long long time ago. Uh, but a recent uh, development in this was uh, last year by Hartman, uh, Kamisoko, Konate, and Orsoni, where they again looked at the disk, but studied very uh, meticulously this constant CE, the, which we could call the dominating constant or the sampling constant. Uh, to remind you where the CE comes from, we can go back a second. Here it's this constant, the dependence of it on the underlying set E. So uh, they show that this CE depends polynomially on this uh, quantity here. So if this lower bound is, let's say, gamma, then CE is like gamma to the minus Q. Has to be something like this. And uh, OK, so uh, that was uh, the recent, so it's kind of reinvigorating the study of this problem, uh, their work. And another interesting development that happened very recently this year uh, on archive is by uh, Mattia Calzi and Marco Peloso, who studied the reverse Carlson measures on what's called the homogeneous Siegel domains of type two, which are very complicated. I don't claim to know much about them even, but they're a generalization, as far as I understand, of the upper half space. So you have kind of uh, a real vector space, and then you have some cone for the imaginary direction. And uh, that's the, the setting in which they have studied the reverse Carlson measures. Uh, but again, the important part about these Siegel domains is they too have uh, the group structure. Actually, they have a complete automorphism group, so you can map any two points to each other uh, using a biholomorphic map. All right, so we're going to study this in a kind of outside of the group structure setting where there's a very little to no automorphic structure in the group. So that setting is on the smooth, strongly pseudo-convex domains. So this is the assumption that we're making now on our domain omega in CN. So in this setting, there are many potential invariant metrics. I said before we wanted to test, we had this relative density condition on the uh, balls, which are invariant in some sense. And uh, so there are many potential invariant metrics. There's the Kobayashi metric, there's the Bergman metric, uh, there's also the Kara Theodori metric. Uh, so there are lots of different ones and uh, we'll have to eventually decide which one is is best for this setting. Uh, but since there are no automorphisms, we can't just pick one ball and then map the ball all the way around the domain using the automorphisms. So what we'll have to do uh, is first, we um, avoid this uh, metric, this like geometric metric uh, condition on the density and instead test with something that's uh, maybe more natural in this general domain setting, which is we take the uh, reproducing kernel for the Bergman space, which is here, and we normalize it. So we look at the normalized kernel, and then we introduce this quantity. So we're testing the dominating set condition on the reproducing kernel, on the normalized reproducing kernels, right? So 
definitely a necessary condition for E to be a dominating set is that this quantity remain positive. And we're using this T tilde E because it's act, this is actually related to the uh, Berezine transform of a toplets, a certain toplets operator, which we'll get to in a second. So that's why we have the notation. And uh, our theorem is the following. So uh, we want to find the uh, dominating sets E. So for any E in omega, following our equivalent. One is saying that E is a dominating set. Uh, two is, a de is our density condition again. So we're going to use Y for our balls because they're going to be in, not in the Euclidean metric, but in some other metric, which we'll have to figure out which one it's going to be. Uh, and then the third condition is the uh, testing condition on the uh, reproducing kernels, Kz. So of course, one implies three. That's immediate. When we Now we want to pick the... Uh, metric so that three implies two and two implies one. We'll have to figure out how to do that. Um, but, but this is our main result. And I mean, we'll get to the answer here in a second, what the proper metric is. And we also are able to uh, recover the polynomial dependence on the uh, lower bound. So if the lower bound here, this infimum, or here, this in femum, the density, if either of these lower bounds are gamma, then our constant here is on the order of gamma to uh, some power, is polynomial in gamma. So we're able to recover uh, the polynomial dependence on the relative density. All right, uh, so first let's give some applications of this theorem, and then we will discuss the proof. So one application is to what's called the uh, reproducing kernel hypothesis or reproducing kernel thesis, which again is related to this uh, testing condition on the um, reproducing kernels. So if we take a positive uh, L infinity function sigma, then we can define the toplets operator by multiplying our function by sigma and projecting uh, from L2 into A2. And uh, oftentimes the uh, quantity of interest for such a Tobin's operator is its Berezine transform, where again, we test. So this is the testing condition. So we test on the reproducing kernels uh, to try and figure out some properties of T sigma. Maybe it's boundedness, it's compactness, Shadden class membership. Uh, and in our case, we're gonna look at invertibility because uh, the dominating set is about the invertibility of a certain restriction operator. So the corollary we get we obtain is that uh, first if we if we restrict our uh, symbol to be smaller than one, we're just normalizing it. And then uh, the result is that if the uh, Berezine transform is positive, if it's bounded below by some gamma, then T is uh, also bounded below by some gamma. So this can this thing I've written here means T sigma F, F bounded below by C gamma to the Q F. Uh, this should, there should be, there's a missing alpha here. Alpha. Okay. Um, so one, if we want to test for invertibility of our operator, it's enough to test uh, over the reproducing kernels. And same thing for boundedness. So this uh, shows us that if our, the supremum here is smaller than one minus gamma, then the norm of uh, T is also smaller than one minus a little bit. So we have to pay the price. You know, this, this is gonna be much smaller than gamma itself. Uh, but this does give an interesting uh, corollary, which is that if this is ever smaller than one at all, then this also must be smaller than one. So usually um, the kinds of inequalities one will get for the uh, reproducing kernel thesis or boundedness are like uh, norm of T sigma smaller than a constant times the supremum of the Berezine transform. 
And this doesn't ever tell you if you want to know like that your operator is close, has norms smaller than one, this will not get you anywhere unless this quantity is very, very, very small, right? Because usually C is large. So this is, uh, this is, can be as viewed as an improvement on, um, on this in certain ranges, right? Of course, if this is super duper small, then, then this is a better estimate than this one. But for, uh, for this is close to one, this is an, an improvement. Okay. So now let's continue uh, the ingredients of the proof. So for those who have done this dominating set uh, work before, oftentimes what you do is you boil the global estimate down to a local estimate. So that's what we're going to focus on first is a local estimate. Um, but if we have the local estimate, then we can get to the uh, the global one using this technique that I have here. So this proposition is sort of just a, an abstract version of what has been done in many dominating sets papers before. Uh, so usually you take your domain omega, you decompose it into some sets, which we're gonna call YK. So take our domain, decompose it into a bunch of sets YK. And each YK has a, a double, it's not formally a double, but we can think of it as some larger set xk, where the x's have finite overlap, and x and y have some sort of uh, separation property. Or again, you can think of this like a doubling property, uh, but it's a little more of a fuzzy version of that. So what we're saying here is we assume that y and x satisfy the following conditions. So dk is just a scaling parameter that doesn't really matter so much, but of course you can dilate the uh, sets by how or whatever you want. Uh, so DK doesn't so much matter, but the important part is that the, uh, the, the ratio between the uh, diameter, oh, there's a typo. This should be to the power two in, okay. But there's a uh, re relationship between the the measure of the set and the, its diameter to the power two n. So this is saying that it's not too degenerate. Like if it was super duper thin, right there, would, then this would be violated. And then this is about the boundary separation between x and y. So if we think of our sets, they need to look something like y could be something like this, x could be something like this. Right. So we think of this as x and y. Okay, then for any uh, subset of omega, E subset of omega, we just test our relative density condition, uh, E on each uh, Y, K. If this remains positive, then we have the uh, dominating set inequality. So the, the way to do this is kind of standard now. You do this good, bad argument. So you call an index good if, uh, the mass on the smaller set is larger than the mass on the larger set. So the reverse inequality always holds, but we're asking for uh, yk is the smaller set. And we must, of course, inflate it by some large factor. We'll pick m later. So this, you call this, it's how you determine that set is good. And by the finite overlap, the good sets will be a large portion of, the, of all of the sets. But on each good set, we will use this Remez type inequality. So this is the local estimate that we need to prove. And the local estimate says that the values on YK can be recovered by the values on EK, but we must pay the price of the larger set, XK. But there's uh, you know, this theta one minus theta here. So uh, this ratio will of course tell us that if F is zero here, then F must be zero everywhere, but this is much stronger. I mean, that, that first part is obvious about the unique continuation. This is called the quantitative propagation of smallness or also called a Remez type inequality. So we'll prove this later, uh, but using this result, uh, so we, we apply this result on each good set. And then by the finite overlap, the mass on 
omega is comparable to the mass on the good sets. And then on the good sets, this is comparable to this. That's the whole uh, point of defining them that way. So we actually get L2 to E, and then we sum back up, to pick up some constant. So that's the strategy. The only thing left is boiling it down to the, and we've already boiled it down to the uh, local estimate. We just need to prove this local estimate now. And this is where we're going to use these um, geometric conditions on Y and X. Okay, all we used here actually was the finite overlap. So this is, um, in some sense, a hard question, but it's been studied uh, a lot. Uh, so you can even think in the abstract. Uh, so fix two numbers, a constant and a theta between zero and one. Then for what sets do we have this inequality for all holomorphic functions x? So this is kind of like a three spheres theorem or three circles theorem in one complex variable if n equals one, right? And x, y, and e are all spheres. So we're, we kind of want to wiggle all of these uh, three sphere, this three sphere type inequality, right? So classically, there is the Hadamard three circle theorem. There's nevin linus theorem on two constants, which is a, again, a similar thing uh, using the harmonic uh, extension of a function, the Poisson kernel. Then uh, there is a very uh, difficult paper by Alexander Brittany in 1999, proving this same thing for uh, any F, which are pluri subharmonic, so more general than holomorphic, and any E of positive measure. This has also been studied uh, when E and Y are in the real line, and X is a complex neighborhood uh, by many uh, authors, uh, which I have stated here. And then, uh, also a very interesting result that's you know, much, much more difficult than anything else on here, in my opinion, is that uh, this actually also holds for any solution of an uh, elliptic PDE. Uh, and you can even take E to be a lower dimensional set. So this is a much, uh, very difficult result, but uh, this shows it all that this thing has been studied before. But the, the trick for us is actually that we want this for uh, X and Y to be more wild geometries, right? Determined by these uh, certain complex uh, metrics. And all of these results, I did not mention, but I'll say now, actually use the fact that X and Y are Euclidean balls, which is not gonna work for us. We're, we, we have to apply it in a more general setting. So uh, we have to study uh, six. And what we need to pay attention to is not what has been paid attention to in the past, which is the geometry of X and Y and how they are related. So the way we'll prove this is uh, as follows. So now this is the local estimate. I should have put a title here maybe. So this is the local estimate that we want to prove or the Rumez type inequality. Rumez inequality. So again, we're, uh, we've removed the scaling parameter or this affine map stuff. Uh, but again, that's, that's, uh, that doesn't really matter just because the, the conclusion doesn't pay attention to affine maps. So uh, if X and Y are in uh, CN and they satisfy, again, this not too thin setting and this boundary separation, then uh, we have the Rumez inequality. And the way we're going to prove this is using uh, Carleman estimate, which is a theory, which is a technique that originally began in complex analysis, but then was quickly taken over by uh, PDEs. So we'll try to bring it back here into complex analysis. So uh, we can prove a Carleman estimate for the D-bar operator. This was what it was originally used for. Uh, by, in, uh, by Hormander, and the, what it states is that you know, for any uh, C-infinity function compactly supported, that you just integrate by parts to get this estimate. So for each D-bar operator, you just uh, 
you know, integrate by parts by putting it onto E, what the what gets spit out. Turns out it's just the Laplacian of uh, this real function uh, phi. And then we pick G of a, uh, oh, first we pick, sorry, first we pick phi of a special form. So we want to, in, so we have our set X here and we want to introduce Y and E. So we pick uh, phi for its Laplacian to be indicator of Y minus the indicator of omega, uh, of, of, sorry, minus the indicator of E. And uh, we have these scaling constants, but those are not so important. Um, maybe I should pause for a second. Uh, how, what time am I supposed to go until 25 or 30? Uh, in fact, it's uh, 25, but uh, you can have uh, one more minute if you want. Okay, okay, great. So uh, we need to uh, solve this uh, equation and we want to pick rho so that, uh, well, let me just say, we pick rho and s small enough that uh, phi is actually smaller on, it's larger on y than it is near the boundary. And this is where we use these geometric properties here uh, to estimate the green functions and so forth. So uh, I will skip those details. Uh, but then we just conclude, conclude with the Carloman estimate. So uh, let me just finally say uh, that, uh, so we've got the uh, estimate here uh, that the density implies one. And so we just need to find a metric whose uh, balls satisfy these geometric conditions and whose balls are related to the kernel in a way that three implies two. And it turns out, I'll just skip to the end, that the answer is the Kobayashi metric. So uh, I do not know too much about the uh, complex geometry and everything, but we were able to use some results of many other people to show that the Kobayashi metric balls indeed satisfy uh, these geometric conditions. And then using some estimates on the Bergman kernel, uh, we were able to show that uh, the, uh, this condition on the reproducing kernels implies the uh, density condition for the Kobayashi ball. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop right there with stating the uh, final theorem. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Walton. Thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, is there any question? Maybe I have a question. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for, for the nice presentation. Andreas. Uh, so we are uh, telling in the beginning that you have an estimate of the, um, uh, of the sampling constant. So C yes. depending on uh, gamma, do you have some um, estimate on Q? It depends maybe on the geometry of the... Okay. Sample. Uh, no, we do not know the depend the, the exponent on okay. Q. It's it's uh, it depends on the R, of course, that you pick for the the radius of the testing. But the way it depends on that, we have no idea because even these estimates on the uh, Kobayashi balls, they do not even you can't know the dependence of them on R. So. Uh, we really have no way of getting that. And in some specific situations, uh, well, I'm not very uh, acquainted neither with uh, uh, Kobayashi balls, but uh, I oh, imagine maybe. that in really <laughs> specific situations, um, you can maybe hope for something more explicit, and maybe then uh, yes, yes, I think on the like for the on the ball on okay. the end, the Kobayashi metric coincides with the Bergman metric. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that case, can probably get uh, some. Uh, then, then, then the balls. I think you actually even know the exact formula for those balls. So that should be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, Q. Uh, I don't think it'll be a. At least using our methods, I don't think it will be necessarily a good uh, parameter. I don't think we'll really. It will be sharp. I don't think it will be sharp. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's difficult to get a sharp one, but um, yeah, because sharp would be like minus one, probably, right? 
Yeah, well, that's yeah, true. <laughs> that's like the best possible, right? Right. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Any any other question? So if not, um, we maybe we we will uh, continue with the next speaker.